One of the obvious items that comes up when I talk about the Deuteronomy 32 worldview is what scholars typically refer to as cosmic geography. It creates a theology of when Yahweh then turns around right after Babel and calls Abraham and promises him a land, that sets up really the rest of the Old Testament, frankly, the rest of the Bible, because you have then Israel, God's people, the descendants of Abraham, occupying this land. You have that play out very obviously in the New Testament in Pauline vocabulary. Now, Paul does use the word demons occasionally, but most of the time he talks about the powers of darkness. It's with terms like principalities, powers, rulers, thrones, dominions, authorities. And what they have in common is their terms of geographical dominion. And so Paul is getting his theology from this Old Testament stuff. And they're different than demons, but again, they have a common enemy, they're, they're evil, they're all you know, part of the panoply of the powers of darkness. But the whole notion of attachment to specific regions and places is what's going on here. So you get these stories, Nahum and the leper. Why does Naaman ask for dirt? It's because he knows that Yahweh is attached to this place. He's gonna go back home to Syria. He's going to go back home and do his job, but he needs geography. He needs dirt on which to sacrifice and worship the true God. And I think Heiser was, was so uh, groundbreaking with that, to be able to cross worlds, uh, bridge gaps where it needed to be. And, uh, you know, you what you just brought up with the, the um, uh, divine council or the uh, rogue uh, leaders of the nation, spiritual beings, the, having that connection with the land is super important for us as we move on to this last clip uh, with Heiser going over the divorce of the nations at Babel and what I call family planning um, that God brought forth with Abraham. So let's cut over to this last clip. What God does is he divorces them. And then he says, okay, I'm going to show you how it was supposed to be done. I've divorced all of you, so now I need a new people. Okay, I'm going to go over to this guy, Abraham, in Ur, and I'm going to call him. And he's too old to have kids, and his wife's too old to have kids, but now watch. Okay, I'm going to raise up for myself my own inheritance. Jacob is my allotted heritage. Israel is my portion on the planet. I've consigned the rest of you under the authority of other lesser Elohim. Hopefully they will rule according to my justice. They'll be like me. Hopefully... You will be able to look at my people now, Israel, as what life would be like if you were living in relationship to me. And if, if my people follow the law, they'll be happy. They'll have good lives. I will bring them to a land. They'll enjoy life. That land is now sort of a mini Eden or a new Eden. At least it's supposed to be because I'm there. I'm there. Heaven is going to meet earth again. I will occupy that space. That will be sacred space. They will be a kingdom of priests between me and you. And they're supposed to attract you back to wanting a relationship with me, not one of these other guys. In the Psalm 82, the gods become corrupt. They, get, they seduce the Israelites into worshiping them. The whole thing, you know, just sort of blows up because humans are wicked because they are corrupted, again, by other forces, you know, outside of their own nature. And they got a lot, of people, we have a lot working against us, okay? We sure do. We sure do. All right, so Mike, before I say anything, tell me your thoughts on that clip from Mike Heiser talking about Babel. Uh, I think well, some people don't realize that there is a connection between, you know, Genesis 11 and Deuteronomy 32, or actually even, I would even put, dial back a little bit further to even Deuteronomy chapter 4, right, where Deuteronomy 32 is the poetic uh, rendition and description of, of Deuteronomy 4, where it talks about, you know, don't worship the sun, moon, stars, don't, don't worship these other gods and everything that the other peoples, you know, that they have been consigned to, 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 these, to these folks. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize the, the actual practical implications of Genesis 11 throughout the, the biblical meta narrative, where you have these 70 nations that are mentioned. And 
think of it from an ancient Israelite perspective, right? They're trying to explain how in the world did the world become the way that the world is? Why are we like, why are there so many people groups? Why are there so many people groups who worship so many different gods and goddesses? And so what Genesis 11 is pointing out to is the, the very starting point, the, the seed that begins to grow into what eventually the Israelites in their later time, they would see as there are all these different nations and all these different gods that these nations worship. And like, how, how, how did that happen? And so that is a little bit of what Genesis 11 is pointing out. And, you know, it goes right into the Deuteronomy 32 verse 8, you know, context of the sons of God, not the sons of Israel, but the sons of God were allotted to take care of these different people groups. Uh, the way that Mike described it, I, I like it. I think the way that he uses the word divorce, like maybe. I think uh, another way of saying it is that these divine beings were designated to govern, to take care of, you know, these different people groups, yeah. while Yahweh was going to focus on Abraham and his wife, Sarah, and, and, yep. and I need to spend time with them. And in many ways, it's a very subtle thing that's, that Mike's kind of alluding to, is the importance of one choosing, laying down one's loyalty to Yahweh willingly, mm -hmm. right? Like, like he wants to show this is what it means to be part of my family. And is it not really good? So good, in fact, that the other nations would be, I like that. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I think that that's actually a lot better than the deal that we have. How, how do we get into this? <laughs> like, how, yeah. how do we yeah. get, how do, yeah. how, like, what's going on here? It, it, like, that was the point, right? And um, on the Ask a Scholar I, podcast, uh, you know, me and Carla, we had a, a Levitical scholar, uh, Jay Scalar, Bar, on. Yeah. And one of the things that we talked about was like, yes, we as moderns, especially as Gentile moderns, right? We're reading Leviticus and we're just thinking like, my gosh, like I can't eat pork. I, I have to do this. I can't touch seafood. Like, like we're, we're like so thinking about all these weird things. But what's really going on is that we're not realizing we are one culture looking at another culture. And there is a little bit of translation. There's a little bit of culture shock that's happening. But ultimately, like that same kind of thing is happening with their neighbors. Yeah. Right. You will have people who are not Israelite, but they'll come into the land of Israel because they got some goods to sell. I got some great cedar that I want to sell you and, and whatnot. And they'll eat a, eat a meal. Like, hey, do you have a, do you have a pork belly dish? No, nope, we don't serve pork, but we do have some great beef ribs. Right. And, 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 <laughs> and so they'll they'll start talking and conversing like, why don't you guys have pork? Like pigs are awesome. It's like, no, well, it's because our God doesn't want us to be eating those, those animals because they're not kosher. What the heck is kosher, right? Like, and you, you get into conversation and dialogue and that's in some sense a very natural and all relational way of connecting with people. Yeah. And, and so it, it's a brilliant plan because would it not be awesome if people volitionally on their own decide to worship the same God, right? Like I will actually choose, like I actually want to not because I'm being forced to, but because I want to worship this God. Yeah. Uh, not because I'm obligated because it's family tradition or it's just, this is what we have always done, but because I get to choose, I will actually want to worship this life giving life source of a God who is way better than the ones that, that my family had worshiped. Like it's a brilliant plan because what you get all wrapped up into that package is love, devotion, affection, loyalty, you, you get volition, you get, I have decided and I am not going to turn back kind of thing. Yeah. No. And I, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that to kind of nuance what Mike was talking about with divorce. That's why I use the word family planning that like at Babel, it wasn't disinheriting. It was planning to bring back in like the, the, the whole goal of Yahweh identifying himself with Abraham and this specific people group was so that it would flow out into the nations and call them into the worship of the one true God. 
And, you know, then, like Mike said, we have the odds stacked against us because these uh, uh, um, divine council that were ruling the nations were supposed to govern and, and bring them up the right way, and they rebelled. And we have them trying to seduce the Israelites to worship them and everyone else. When was humanity divided into nations? That was at Babel. God allotted the nations to the members of his divine council. The Bible says this is why the ancient nations worshipped other gods. God decided to let the members of his divine council govern the other nations in response to humanity's rebellion at Babel. But the gods of the nations failed to rule justly. God chastises them in Psalm 82. Then God pronounces a judgment on them. I have said, you are gods and sons of the Most High, all of you. However, you will die like men, and you will fall like one of the princes. The gods will be judged, punished, and will die. It's startling to read these things. God is so angry with his corrupt heavenly sons that he condemns them. Some passages in the prophets place the fulfillment of this punishment in the end times at the day of the Lord. Do we realize how dramatic the judgment at Babel really was? When it was over, God had no relationship with humanity, but God still wanted a family, and he already had a plan to fix that problem. He'd begin with one man named Abraham. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't yet, please subscribe, like, share, turn on the alerts for this channel. All those things help us get the message out about what God has done for this world, and we're so excited to have you here along for the journey. Tune in, uh, stay tuned as we always say, the beginning is near. We've got more coming. See you soon.